everyone and welcome to this evidence session on veterinary issues and a potential EU-UK agreement on those issues. Um, the trade in animal products is absolutely essential to both the EU and the United Kingdom and attracts far greater attention than the economic value might suggest. So we are delighted this morning to welcome James Russell, President of the British Veterinary Association, Gary McFarlane, Director of the Chartered Institute of Environmental Health in Northern Ireland, Gail Souter, who is the Chief EU Exit and Internal Trade Advisor for the National Farmers Union, and Richard Griffiths, Chief Executive of the British Poultry Council. Because of time constraints, we're going to go pretty much straight into the question session. But um, James Russell, I'd like to ask you just to say a few words uh, on behalf of those who have launched a report this morning, or it is act that has effectively been launched at this meeting uh, from the SPS uh, certification working group. So if you'd like to take the floor first, James, and then I'll move into the questions. Thank you, Chair. And yeah, the, the SPS certification working group is a group which has come together from right across industry and the certifiers. And we've been meeting together since before the end of the grace period to look and try and identify issues. But more importantly, I think, to explore solutions and to engage with government on how we might achieve some of those solutions. And we're very pleased that DEFRA have engaged with that group, especially through the work of our, of our government vets. So the report that we're releasing today um, urgently calls for a new veterinary agreement and to streamline the processes because you know, quite honestly the restrictions that uh, are being imposed on those exporting companies at the moment are crippling their ability to export to the EU which we know is Britain's largest trading partner but also is restricting movement of goods between Great Britain and Northern Ireland. So we're really grateful for the opportunity to explore that report within this session. And uh, we welcome the fact that we feel there's a, a nicely balanced panel here today to be able to answer all the questions around that. So thank you, Chair. Thank you very much indeed. So we now go to the first question, Claire Hanna. The question I gather is directed mainly at uh, Gary first, please. Claire, the floor is yours. Th thank you very much much um gary and thank you for your um your, your presentation my, my apologies i actually um wasn't sure that it was my my question but um there's 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 plenty of good uh, questions to ask what's what's the role of uh, veterinary checks and export health certificates um in in the food and drinks uh, exports and um can you outline how this has changed um since since brexit and the new year Thanks, Claire, and good morning, everyone. Um, yeah, uh, obviously, as you might expect me to say, uh, coming from an environmental health background, it's really important to remain focused on the fact that um, whether it's export to other countries, um, in which case, obviously, other countries call the shots, or whether it's imports into this country, phytosanitary controls and checks are about public health and public protection. That's why they're there. That's why they're important. Um, and I think we need to underscore this discussion this morning with that point to start with. Um, now, obviously, um, in very simplistic terms, um, the EU has arguably, in my view, one of the best public health health protection systems in the world when it comes to food standards. Um, the UK has left that particular uh, uh, arrangement. <clears throat> and in the absence of properly negotiated agreements, which is really, in my view, what the problem, where, where the root of the, this problem lies, we are now, uh, of course, required by the EU to demonstrate compliance with their standards. And so in very simple terms, that's where the uh, additional uh, burdens have come from. Um, and as uh, I'm sure James and other colleagues will, will uh, subscribe to, part of the solution to this, in my view, is a properly negotiated agreement around veterinary controls so that we get some way back towards where we were prior to uh, uh, the new year 
in 2021 whenever these new arrangements kicked in. Because if we don't do that, then once we get to the end of this year, um, we're into another great, uh, another significant unknown, I think, in terms of the impacts. And it's important, I mean, obviously there are impacts on businesses, but there are also impacts for um, the bodies that actually are required to carry out the checks. And that's different uh, across the UK, slightly different arrangements in Northern Ireland from the rest of the UK. Um, but it does involve both veterinarians and environmental health practitioners. I hope that clarifies. It, it, it does. Thank you, James. Is, is there anything you'd like to um, add to that? Uh, thank you. I was sort of working through the notes I've got here as Gary was speaking and feel that he's, uh, he's hit most of the points that I would want to make. But I think just to reinforce the point that you know, these are necessary and important checks for, for food safety and for um, uh, disease protection as well as we begin to talk about import checks later on. Um, so yeah, really pleased that we're starting to talk around how do we develop and improve the ability to apply those checks uh, and recognising that they're not something that we just need to try and work around. That's great. Thank you very much. Uh, Chair, back to you. Thanks very much indeed. Uh, Dr Whitford, Philippa Whitford, you have a supplementary on this. Please. Yeah, thanks very much, Chair. If I could come to Gail Souter and also Gary may want to contribute briefly. Um, at our last session, we heard of small businesses having to abandon direct internet selling to individual customers in the EU because of the impact of customs duties and VAT. But is it not the case that with no veterinary agreement, this is even worse for those selling food products such as cheese, smoked salmon, or specialist meats, as even small volume shipments require an export health certificate, which is prohibitively expensive? Okay. Yeah, thank you for the question. Yeah, I absolutely wholeheartedly agree. Um, we've had a number of um, uh, members and a few members um, Sort of, uh, small businesses, food businesses that have come to us because they have really struggled with the with the bureaucracy. And you're absolutely right to pick up that there has been a tendency to silo issues into customs, which is sort of dealt with by HMRC, which is fiendishly complicated. And then there's the SPS checks, which is more managed by DEFRA, and again, is, is very, very uh, complicated. I, I think that the government is getting better at trying to um, bring the kind of the, the breadth of the requirements on businesses together, but there is still a tendency for those to be siloed, and that doesn't help with with um, uh, you know understanding and, and the ability to to um, engage in, in these processes. So you're absolutely right. Um, the actual cost of getting a certificate, um, uh, employing a vet to do the consignment uh, based checks, you know, is very very restrictive. Uh, if you take it the example, um, and I'm sure James can probably talk about some more uh, actual figures, but if you take the example for, for GB to Northern Ireland, um, the government is reimbursing up to a maximum of £150 per uh, export health certificate. So if you've got a consignment, a hamper of cheese and wine that is valued at £90, but it costs you know up to £150 to get the certificate, you can see very quickly that it's just not practical to continue with with that business. Um, so I absolutely heart, wholeheartedly agree with, with the concern. I don't know whether Gary or James or anyone else wants to add anything, particularly around this kind of micro selling, which had grown up through the internet. Yeah, uh, Philippa, it's Gary here. Yeah, just uh, to 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 add, really, I suppose that it's not just the there are not just issues around the cost to business. There is the capacity issues around the issue of export health certificates. So um, I know there's a question around funding for this, but but the point I'm really trying to make is throwing all the money in the world at this would not necessarily fix it because. Um, not only do businesses have to pay for these, and incidentally, it's slightly different in Northern Ireland where the veterinary checks are actually carried out by DERA officials. Um, so it's a different arrangement to uh, Great Britain. But notwithstanding that, there are capacity issues for both vets and EH personnel involved in this. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm in Ayrshire, so, you know, we export significantly to Northern Ireland. So both my local fishing industry and the kind of specialty foods have been hit by this. Yeah, I would imagine so, yeah. Anyone else, James, or anyone else who wishes to make a comment? 
add to that, I won't repeat what's already been said, but just to add to that as well, I think the particular challenges of those short shelf life products which are trying to be exported as well where we know that we need to have this 24-hour pre-notification of um, you know the requirement for a BCP to be ready for an import check and we understand why that's there that's there so that the capacity can be put in place to ensure that those checks can be carried out but you can imagine that on products which are you know uh, it, perhaps just have a few days of life on them anyway that that adds just another layer of complexity to getting that system completed. I mean, that's been a major issue for my local fishing fleet. Um, it's langoustine and lobster and 85% of it goes to the EU and they are still struggling uh, with the issues. They just can't get it there fresh enough to, to get the prices they used to. Uh, that's fine, Chair, if no one else has anything else to add. Thank you very much. Then we'll move on to the second question from Tamara Chinchik, please. Thank, thank you very much, Chair. So my question is directed primarily at Richard and Gail. Um, it is this, businesses have many concerns about the new processes. To what degree does the UK government have any control over these or is it entirely down to the requirements of the importing country? Uh, Richard, you first, please. Well, at its core, it is down to the importing country, but uh, I think part of this discussion um, and the, uh, the questions are coming up later, and James has already mentioned it about a veterinary agreement. Um, that's where you can smooth those edges and reduce the impact and, and burden of the requirements. Um, I totally agree with what's been said about the, the, the importance of the sanitary and phytosanitary checks. It's absolutely essential for good food. Um, but we can do better at agreeing with the EU um, how and where and when we do these checks. Um, regulatory alignment, not a popular term in government at the moment, but regulatory alignment plays a huge role in ensuring that a veterinary agreement could be reached. Um, so it's those route while, while the fundamental requirements are within the importing country, the ways in which we can achieve it are potentially manageable and, and we can negotiate on those. So there is, there is, for my, my mind, there is opportunity there if we can come to an agreement. Thank you. Thank you. Gail? Yeah, thank you. To, to add, I would definitely say continued negotiations is within the gift of, of our government. Um, I think the government has sort of made clear that it's not going to diverge from EU rules for the sake of divergence, which we obviously welcome. But we're, we're almost in the worst of all worlds now at the moment in that um, you know, we're feeling the full brunt of third country control from the EU and, and we haven't diverged. And what our position and very much supported through the STS certification working group document published today is that you know we are in this unique starting point where our rules are aligned with the with the EU we continue to share many of the same values uh, expectations so from an outcome perspective I don't suspect that our regulatory landscape is going to change such that it would create that sort of you know, actual real pressure on public health, on animal, uh, plant biodiversity concerns, etc. So we're, we're really looking for the government to sort of continue to negotiate, to show willingness that it is looking for these pragmatic uh, solutions to try and, you know, deal with the, with the friction. Um, just another couple of points, and I've mentioned it already, but, you know, it's within the government's gift to ensure that there is adequate resourcing, again, available for um, in training vets, uh, training certifying officers, um, ensuring that there are enough uh, support officers at ports, customs officials to help with the process because, as I said earlier, it's fiendishly uh, complicated and if you've got that kind of, you know, dedicated, well-resourced, and, and I agree, you know, probably throwing as much money at this isn't going to be the problem, but you can, government can do more to ensure that there are enough customs uh, support agents out there to help people with their with their customs rules to navigate people through uh, the SPS uh, requirements and the clear communications you know we government has done um, a good job in producing a huge I'm amount a huge yeah. amount of um, guidance uh, but it's still overwhelming for a small business a micro business you know where do you go 
um, if they can create one stop shops like they have with the, the trader support service that they have for Northern Ireland, that could help with some of the, the GB to EU trade as well. So there are um, you know, some things that are within the gift of, of our government and whilst they are doing um, some you know, efforts and, and I commend that, um, the job at hand requires a huge amount more effort than, than what we are currently seeing. Thank you, Gail. And just before I hand back to the chair, I wonder if Gary or James, you have any points to add? Uh, yeah, thank you. I would just add in the other bit that I think is within the UK government's um, competence, which is to start to plan now um, more effectively for what we will do with the imports regime as that comes online, because we recognise that that will be you know, another demand on um, you know, veterinary time in particular, but, but on, on time more generally. Um, we know that that's been delayed, but we need to use this opportunity to streamline that imports regime and look at a more risk-based and bespoke um, risk priority uh, system for the UK. And I'd like to highlight that, you know, as vets, we haven't yet been engaged in that work. Thank you. Um, and lastly, the, uh, I've got um, Gary, do you have any points? Uh, th thank you. Well, just briefly to really uh, support what Richard said, because um, I absolutely agree with him. Um, it's, it, it, it's not a politically popular thing to say, but again, trying to get this down to simplistic, pragmatic, um, a, a simple pragmatic look at this. Um, as I said at the start, the key here is making sure that we either maintain or exceed the standards that the EU require. And, you know, I said at the start that the EU food safety standards are the best in the world, and so too are their environmental standards, mm -hmm. and that's very linked to all of this, mm -hmm. uh, because clearly, of course, environmental standards affect food. Um, so to me, you know, it makes absolute sense. Why would we not want the best food safety and environmental standards in the world? It, 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 you know, it, from a business point of view, it makes complete sense to me. So just Thank really support what Richard said. Thank you for that. Um, and I love that you're doing this from the car. It's very 21st century solutions. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, we're, I'm actually on, 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 on holiday today. Okay, so, well, enjoy, yeah. enjoy your holiday after the session and I'll hand back to the chair. Thank you very much to everyone. Thanks very much indeed. Um, thanks, Tamara. And I um, hope your committee session goes well. Tamara's going off now to go and give evidence to a select committee. Third question, Liz Savile-Roberts, please. You have the floor. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, now, part of the work that we've done so far, we've, been, we've seen pictures and visualizations of the extensive forms which need to be printed and physically signed. And also, you know, reading in the SPS Certification Working Group's report, um, description of the, the documentation as it stands as being, um, well, the present situation as being a throwback to the 1970s and archaic and not fit for purpose. Um, I'd like to address my question, therefore, to, to Richard and then to Gary in the first instance, but do you think this process can and should be automated and how would that help UK exporters? Um, Richard, first of all, please. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. I mean, that's one of the fundamentals that we need to need to embrace is the digitalization of the process that will help immensely and um, to streamline the process to ease the, the burden on people um we've already talked about sort of a, a lack of people um but it's also it, i think it's it's an indicator for the additional effort that has had to be put in by businesses um yes there's the forms and the and, and the administration side um but also within the system there's been massive additional requirements for time for people in the preparation of, of, of trade, for the preparation of loads, the all the uh, internal business requirements as well. Um, so when you, it's not just about the burden, it's about the cost. At the moment in our sector, we estimate that um, the additional cost per load, per lorry load is around 750 to a thousand pounds additional from what it was and when you consider that we alone as the poultry meat industry export up to 400 loads a week that's an awful lot of money that is being have to be having to be found money and resources so 
is the first digitalization is the first step, but it's absolutely crucial. Thank you very much. Could you just quantify how long it actually takes to, to fill in these forms? I don't have that figure yeah. to hand, but um, perhaps others may be able to. Okay, I'll, I'll pass it, but I think, thank you very much for quantifying it in the financial terms. I think it's really useful. And um, Gary? Um, thanks, Liz. Yes, just to absolutely agree again, once again with Richard, and um, we have actually engaged with members, our members on the front line of this. So to give the uh, commission some some flavour for this, uh, the, the the forms on the if you like the regulatory check side are all largely paper based at this present moment in time. Um, now there are reasons for that and whilst the, the only caveat i would add whilst i absolutely think a digital solution is the way to go we it needs to be robust it needs to have checks and balances built in around security so that i mean part of the reason why the forms are paper based is it's much 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 less it's much more difficult to actually fraudulently reproduce them um but that doesn't mean that there's in this day and age there's not good digital solutions i mean if you are um just to go back to uh, philippa's point if you're a fishing boat unloading langostines on the isle of mole and the forms aren't right then the officer has to go back to the mainland on a ferry to get a form that's that's how bad the implication you know for colleagues in northern ireland if it's if it's port of Ogie, they have to go back to ards to reprint forms and print them out again with all the subsequent delays that takes, particularly when you're talking about uh, short shelf life, fresh products. So absolutely digitization is the way to go. Oh, thanks for that illustration, Gary. James, do you want to contribute? Yeah, thank you. Uh, if I may, just to start by recognizing that whilst we absolutely welcome the idea of digitization that you know it's going to facilitate the work that's being done here rather than to eliminate um, the need for it but hopefully we can therefore be working much more effectively um, but if I can help by trying to add a little bit of uh, time to this you know the time that's being spent on this and um, this is I think included in the report that the SPS working group has submitted today but until the end of May um, we estimated that excluding um, excluding sort of equine and pet travel so just looking at products of animal origin we were something like 13 and a half thousand percent up on this time last year having completed uh, roughly 121,000 certificates and our best estimate was that that is 116 years of ov time so i, I should say ov or um export health officer uh, environmental health officer time uh, to complete those certificates. So I think that gives a bit of a flavour for the, you know, for the for the ask that we're making of, of these people. Thank you very much indeed. That's a very useful illustration as well. Uh, Gail, just is there anything else you'd like to add on that? Okay. Um, thank you very much, Chair. Thank you. Back to you. Thanks, Liz. Fourth question, please. Leila Moran. Um, thank you, Chair, uh, and thank you to everyone. Um, actually, I think a lot of what I wanted to ask has kind of been covered by, by Liz's question, but I just, just to sort of go back a step, how many extra checks is this? I mean, so it'll obviously depend on, you know, different uh, uh, products potentially, um, but just, just to sort of take it down to sort of very first principles, what did it used to be? And what is it that is happening now that needs to be automated, that is taking so much time, that is costing so much money just in very simple terms james perhaps do you want to start or anyone else yeah with pleasure and um you know, this was um something that right right from the point at which the um the, you know the eu exit vote was uh, was in place you know we recognized that regardless of whether there was a a deal or a no deal or whatever that there was going to become a need for these uh, export house certificates because we were no longer going to be operating in this single market so you know i think um it's important i think to recognize that yeah, we had some time to prepare for this but that um there was perhaps a degree of, of resistance in some quarters to preparing for but by the end of 2020 government had estimated that there was going to be a, a 300 percent increase in the number of export health certificates required um we think that that well, we understand the maths behind that we think that it is just that you know an estimate and as i've alluded to our concern is that um 
we don't yet know where we're going to end up because we don't yet understand exactly what um, well we understand what the requirements for export certification are going to be once we reach the end of the grace period with Northern Ireland for example but what we can't predict as well is the impact that that's going to have on business and therefore the number of um, of exports which would have taken place which perhaps don't in the future so it remains something which is very hard to predict for the future but I alluded in my answer to the last question as to where we're up to you know as we sat at the end of May this year. Thank you very much does anyone else have anything yes? Uh, Leila just to come in on what James has said and, and to put it very simply um, obviously, the, the answer to, in the previous arrangements, i.e. prior to leaving the EU, none of these checks were required. And that's because we had alignment with European standards. Um, as part of the EU, obviously, we were part of it. And that brings us back to the whole point about the absolute criticality of making sure we get an agreement that aligns with, with those standards. Because if that's negotiated properly, set up properly, then we could get back some considerable way to a situation where many of these checks would actually not be necessary. But the, 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 as James has already alluded with, with figures, and I could give you other practical examples, it's, you know, these checks have gone from zero to, in some cases, tens of thousands per year. And yeah, so actually, Gary, that would be really helpful for me. So that practical examples, could you give us one? I, just I, 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 what, Leila, what I will do, if, if I can email you some figures around that, that would actually illustrate in, in simple numerical terms. That would be fantastic. Gail? Yeah, um, can I just uh, maybe draw your attention to a report that the British Meat Processing Association have done? And in there, they have fantastically scary a diagram of, of a process map which shows the, the, the checks that were required when we were members of the single market and basically uh, if you want to send pork chops to Paris you loaded the lorry and you had a consignment note that the haulier had in, in his cab and then drove off to Paris and that, that was it and actually how they have demonstrated what are the new requirements step by step there's about 25 new steps that are required and I think it does very ably sort of show the the complexity and and how we have gone overnight. You know, nothing changed really in 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 regulatory terms apart from us leaving the transition period. But how we've gone from having no checks to having these full full checks in terms of the process. So, um, if you haven't already seen that BMPA report, I would definitely uh, look for the the Paris um, pork chops to Paris example. Thank you very much. Um, and Richard, I don't know if you've got. Uh, just to, uh, I think, to add that while we talk about the, the export health certificates, which is a, a fantastic example in this, the, the, and I think what Gail is, is, is mentioning here about the BMPA report, is that there's all the business requirements behind this as well. So we're now in a different tax and revenue regime. You're exporting to a different regime. You have to have, um, have to engage an, an agent in at the in the border control post in which the, uh, the 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 trade is happening is going into so there's all these additional costs you have to be registered you have to have your, your, your registration um the the eori number etc etc so there's there's a lot of business administration behind the export health certification as well um so and i think the uh, uh, endorse the bmpa report as well you. Is there is there an estimate of the cost of that extra the the extra registrations that need to, to happen? For for my for my mind, I think I, what I said previously is about seven hundred and fifty to a thousand pounds per load we worked it out out as, and that's across the board for those to cover those um, okay, additional so costs and resources. Okay, understood. Thank you very much. Um, that's it from me. Back to you, Chair. Thank you very much indeed. I'd like to drill down into this just a little. We've talked a great deal about money, which is obviously very important, uh, and a great deal about the time that this takes. But what about the people who are doing it? It presumably involves an enormous amount of manpower, and that manpower has to be trained. So are the trained staff available to do these jobs? And even if they are now, are they going to be available in the future? Um, Richard, perhaps you'd like to have a crack at that one as well, please. 
Okay, I'll try. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll defer to James on the on the veterinary provision because BDBI are the, the experts there. But yes, I think we're. It has been an additional additional result um, burden on businesses to for skilled people. Um, we are seeing at the moment. You were seen in in the media recently the the vacancies across the board in food and farming are enormous and for a sector that for sectors that rely have historically relied on non-uk labor i think the, the gaps are only going to grow and there'll be a, there'll be knock-on effects through businesses um and including into the the trade and export arenas um so yeah we are we are seriously concerned about about the numbers of people who we're going to need in the future i mean we're we're relatively relatively small in terms of people sector but that just means that when there are gaps when there are vacancies it's it's doubly important for us to to, to be able to fill those roles um but yes it, the the burden has increased and we are concerned about the future of skills uh, and people I'm going to come to the veterinary aspect of this and James in a moment, but from the more technical point of view, um, Gary, are the people available um, to do the work that you're involved in? Uh, well, James, uh, obviously the, the, this falls down to a breakdown between uh, qualified vets and qualified EHOs. So James yeah. will comment on, on the veterinary side better than me, uh, mm. but in simple, in a very, very simple blunt answer, no, they're not. Um, there is not the trained staff out there, even if all the money, again, it's back to money not being the solution here. Um, uh, and and I think that, that that is something that we have been raising with government in general about the need to invest in the environmental health workforce um, in terms of provision and capacity for the future. Um, so in simple terms, no, there's not there's not enough of there's not enough qualified people out there to do the work. So so uh, and, and what we're seeing is um, significant numbers of advertisements for new personnel in the ports, um, in BCPs um, and local authorities in general, um, anywhere where they have export ex businesses that are exporting and they're struggling to find staff. Do you know if we're taking any steps to try and train these people with a view to the future? Um, I don't, uh, Sir Roger. Uh, uh, as I say, we, 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 we are raising this issue. Um, and uh, whilst we have seen, uh, we, we ourselves within CIH have run some uh, campaigns recently. I mean, this, it's not just exports. I mean, the pandemic has highlighted the, the, the lack of um, trained staff in environmental health. Uh, we have brought that to the attention of government, but there are ways in which the government could really assist with this. We have run our, our own campaigns and we have seen an increase um, in uh, undergraduates onto undergraduate programmes, but obviously that's a long process before we see any output. But there are other routes into the profession, uh, for example, through apprenticeship schemes and so on and so forth. And there is a lot that could be done to actually increase and build capacity. It's a whole separate conversation, happy to have it elsewhere. Thank you very much indeed, that's most helpful. James, from the veterinary point of view, we know that the overwhelming majority of LVOs used to come from the European Union countries. Given that they're now not doing that, what's the veterinary situation? Yeah, so I think to, to start with, I think, as a profession, we can be really proud that as far as we're aware, there hasn't been a situation yet where um, a consignment has not been able to be exported for want of a veterinary signature. So on the face of it, you know, you could say we're doing OK, we're, we're coping with the capacity needs. Um, but I think there's a number of things behind that. First of all, as I alluded to in an earlier answer, that um, you know that we see the need for veterinary time increasing as we come to the end of the grace periods and as we bring import controls in and so on and so forth. Um, but also, um, the 
increasing number of people required to sign those certificates have been drawn from in in some large part from those official veterinarians carrying out the official checks work for us so our slaughterhouse work the surveillance work which is such an important part of our food safety and of providing food which is going to be appropriate for export in in the final um uh, you know, in the end anyway. So what we are able to report back is that the reduction in English language requirement for those OVs coming to work in a supervised and limited capacity within that slaughterhouse environment, um, which was passed by the Royal, Vet uh, Royal College of Veterinary Surgeons uh, earlier this year, was implemented at the beginning of June because we recognise that where we have a weakness is in that section behind the export health certificate work um, and we maintain a very close liaison with the food standards agency to understand how that contingency is being used but those people are still largely coming in from eve accredited countries so the european association of establishments of veterinary education um, so we have absolutely no concerns about their veterinary qualifications but we've had to reduce this English language requirement in order to better enable people to be able to come in and work because we recognised that it just was not happening in the, in the numbers that we expected. I know that um, UK Chief Veterinary Officer Christine Middlemiss in her evidence session to EFRACOM last week highlighted that it's really difficult to tease out within that how much of that um, reduction in travel to the UK by these uh, vets is to do with uh, COVID and how much of it is to do with Brexit. Um, so I struggle to answer that part of that question, but, but there, you know, there are moves afoot to try and increase the number of people coming in into a profession which we recognise works at somewhere between 10 and 12 percent um, under capacity, which is why we ended up on the shortage occupation list again a couple of years ago. Obviously, we're concerned about human health, but are there any animal welfare implications in all of this? Uh, I think we can be confident that all of the animal welfare checks which need to be carried out are being carried out. Where we would highlight the greater animal uh, health concerns would be the um, side, which I think we will come on to later, Sarandja, about um, the fact that the UK Chief Veterinary Officer it no longer has quite the same access to the European surveillance networks as we did as a member state and we recognise that that places a huge onus on her shoulders to um, utilise her own relationships to understand what those risks are at our borders and, and to try and uh, to, to keep disease out essentially. Thank you and Gail all the animals that we're talking about come from farms what is the NFU view of this? Yeah well I think I would um just use one of the statistics and that from the first quarter of this year the the value of exports uh food and um, um live animal exports down 28 um 687 million pounds so whilst i absolutely agree and commend james and his colleagues for keeping up with with current demand there's no doubt that the demand is dampened in comparison to to normal years so if we strive to get back to where we were as a, as a as a key exporter into the EU market, then there's going to be much greater demand on, on vets. And also, if we look to the situation in Northern Ireland, if the easements that are currently in place, the, the Stamney system that's in place for uh, simplified certification of goods from GB to, to NI comes to an end, and obviously we don't know what's happening with the ongoing negotiations yet, but if it does, that's going to place a huge burden again on, on the shoulders uh, of vets and um, from an NFU perspective, um, you know we are not hearing of any kind of pressure at farm level of, of local vets not being able to service their, their clients because they are um, occupied elsewhere. So I'm pleased to report that you know the, the veterinary service is, is very much you know um, keeping up its, its, its duty with with farmers. So I don't think that there is really an, an on farm uh, effect uh, uh, as yet. But you know the pressures are, are certainly growing in terms of if we want to to get back to some degree of, of normality and increase our exports, then we could start to see the the system really pressured. Thank you very much indeed. Question six, Professor Winters, please. Uh, yes, thank you, Roger. Um, I, I'd like to sort of shift the focus a little bit and ask 
uh, the extent to which uh, we have um, sort of decent levels of cooperation between uh, essentially the central UK authorities and the devolved administrations. And um, I, including plans for when the UK introduces its own import regime, which at the moment it doesn't have, essentially. Um, uh, perhaps Gail um, could start, but let me move around the table afterwards. Yeah, I've, I've no reason from a from a farmer's perspective to doubt that the cooperation is happening between central government and, and the devolves representing NFU England and, and Wales members. I know that there is uh, dialogue and, and conversations. Um, I know there is quite a high degree of cooperation on between officials in terms of the, the West Coast facing ports and the support that they can get from uh, central government in terms of the, the requirements. Um, where I've got a little bit more expertise um, is on the, the sort of engagement on the on the continental perspective. And again, I think there are individual um, initiatives which you know really should be welcome. The government has got liaison uh, sessions with the Belgian government, for example, and their officials, the Dutch government, they are running webinars with the Spanish, the French. So there is a high degree of, of engagement, but you could say maybe it's just a, a drop in the ocean, you know, one webinar session that lasts two or three hours um, helps with understanding, but does it really get out to the, the people on the ground who actually, you know, the customers that actually need to know this knowledge and actually, um, you know, need to understand and the rules and ensure that there is um, sort of uniform application of the rules uh, underway. So I think what they're doing in the current regime is, is fine, you know, they're doing, um, multiple of these webinars, but it comes back to the point we've already you know, made that there is a sort of a fundamental question about, is this the relationship we want to keep going and working with and, and trying to improve, or is there a, a bigger question here in terms of, you know, with veterinary agreement, trying to simplify the process as, as much as possible. So um, it's probably not quite answering your, your question, Professor, um, but I've got no criticism of, of what they're currently doing, except that it is you know, such a, a small drop in the ocean. Oh, well, thank you very much, Gail. In fact, I was going to ask a supplementary question about cooperation with European member states, as opposed to the Commission. So let me sort of throw that in as well. Um, uh, Gary, um, given that you have close connections with the devolved administrations, do you have any views on this? Um, I suppose really just to, to, to echo what Gail has said, I mean, there's no, there's no, um, there's nothing on the face of it, at least, to suggest that there's not uh, dialogue between uh, government officials in Westminster and government officials in the devolved administration, Northern Ireland, Scotland and Wales. Um, to, to, to what extent uh, government officials in Westminster understand the uh, actual ramifications of some of this for devolved nations is perhaps a slightly different question um but uh there's there's you know whilst i don't have i don't have um necessarily detailed insight into this i've not heard anything to suggest uh from speaking to colleagues that there is a lack of of engagement around this thank you uh richard yes thank you um in these first months of the year, I, I would uh, say that we've become very proficient at engaging uh, developed administrations at EU on a technical officials level. Um, I think the I would describe it as firefighting first first quarter of this year. We've had to become good at fixing problems that have arisen. When we started the year, we had we were having loads rejected for having the wrong coloured stamp on the piece of paper. So that's it. That was our starting point. And it has improved since then. I, I would have to say that the CVOs across all the administrations have been extremely helpful and, and have been a fantastic resource for all the all the nations um, and, and the work that their areas have, have, have put in has been has been really, really helpful to industry. Um, my concern is, is as we look ahead, I am not confident that we have the, let's say, the sort of political engagement and the political will 
to find lasting solutions for this because we can't go on firefighting as we have been because there it's just not sustainable whether with the numbers the the the, the vacancies the the lack of resources it is it's simply not sustainable so we've done okay so far because we've had to but it's not a, a long-term solution thank you could you say who cdo's are uh, the chief veterinary officers oh, cvo's okay sorry i missed that thanks very much uh, james any uh, final reactions from you yeah absolutely thank you and uh, yeah, BVA is in regular contact with our four CVOs, our chief veterinary officers, and I think it's important to recognise, you know, the skills, professionals, professionalism and ability to work together that they bring to this. And I think the one thing I would like to point to is that we do have the benefit of having in our Northern Ireland chief veterinary officer someone who is operating an EU BCP. And I would suggest that we could improve this joined up approach by bringing DARA and DEFRA closer together to build on you know an ehd compliance but to pick up on a couple of the points richard has just made um we've engaged with the french embassy since uh, for a good time now i'm right back at the beginning of january we understood for them that non-compliance is accounted for 90 percent of exports at that point um, the most recent weeks that we've got data for brought us up to the 16th of may and we were down to five percent and of that five percent less than half was to do with the quality of certification and building on that further I think perhaps what's important to recognize is that that's not just about the person filling it in getting it wrong it's about the uh, consistency of interpretation by the person reading it at the other end as well um, and um, we, we heard just yesterday of a load of six or, or you know, consignment of six identical loads with six identically completed certificates four of which passed muster and continued on their journeys and two of which were rejected and i don't say that to sort of point out or you know call out those uh, vets who are carrying out those import checks uh, on the eu side but simply to highlight this has been a learning process for all of us and i think that uh, you know by having that cooperation by continuing to engage with DEFRA and using them as our competent authority to work with the Commission um, and highlight where we're finding these difficulties, we've seen great progress being made and uh, we continue to engage with that to make it even better. Thank you. May I just ask a brief follow up question? You said that we've gone down from, I think, was it 60 percent um, rejections to 5 percent rejections. Is that because some people have just stopped trying? In other words, is, is the issue that everyone's got better or some people have just given up and vacated the field? We can certainly share the data with you, Professor. I think it's contained within the SPS working group that shows that, yeah, you know, I think export numbers or certificate numbers are at least at a holding level over that period of time. So I think there's been a huge improvement in compliance, both of the completing people and of the interpreting people over that period of time. Excellent. Thank you very much indeed, everyone. Uh, back to you, Roger. Thank you, Alan. Um, Andrew Bullheimer, please, question seven. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Chair, thank you to each of the witnesses as well for, you know, for the clear evidence. Um, as we look ahead, you know, and we look at the checks, you know, um, for animal products from the EU that are going to be introduced at the start of 2022, I'm very interested in how many extra, you know, sort of levels of checks are going to be needed as a result, you know, of that of that change. So for James first, if that's okay. Thank you. Um, and I'm really sorry to say I don't think we quite know, but, but I don't think we quite know. But what I think we can point to is, you know, the £14 million pounds worth of investment to local authorities to look at trying to recruit 500 new staff, including OVs, just to try and understand where we're at with those import checks. So I think we can begin to get a, an idea of the, uh, the magnitude of scale of this. But I would also point to the fact that we're aware that yeah, you know, there are EU countries who are concerned about this as well, because for every certificate, every consignment, which is going to be checked as an import check on the UK side, there has got to be an export check on the on the EU side. So um, I know that 
uh, again referring back to, to conversations with the French embassy that they were quite pleased that we delayed the implication of import checks earlier this year uh, because they weren't feeling sufficiently prepared at that point and we understand that they perhaps made changes to their rules to allow non-French native vets to do that export certification work and the reason that wasn't available before is a slight difference really in, in, in the setup in France that uh, the people undertaking that work are civil servants, they're government employees. So I think on both sides we're aware of the need to ramp up quite significantly. Are there fallback plans um, or contingency plans? Sort of because it, it's sort of how you described it is it's just unclear, isn't it? And it's only half a year away. Uh, if I could say that we look forward to being engaged in that discussion. Thank you for that. <laughs> um, Gary, maybe be interested in hearing your view, please. Uh, yeah. Thank you. As 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 James has alluded to, um, it it's potentially significant. It's very very difficult to put hard numbers around this, um, but you know, once again, I go back to what I said previously. You know, we're moving from situ under because of the lack of properly negotiated frameworks and standards. We're moving from a situation potentially where none of those checks were required to a situation where, depending on what the UK government decide to implement uh, by way of import checks, um, potentially huge volumes of checks being required. And I, I, you know, I mean, there are solutions to all of this and I know we're going to get to this. I'm conscious that this is all sounding very, um, very concerning. Um, but I do underscore again, and, and this is particularly important for, uh, uh, public protection in the UK, that import controls are going to be critical to ensuring public health. Uh, food crime is rife, colleagues, still. Um, and if we leave open doors, then we put the public at risk. Yeah. Richard, anything to add? I don't have any greater insight and figures on that, but uh... If, if uh, exports, we've gone up from 900, the first four months this year, we've gone up from 900 export health certificates to 110 export health certificates needed for exports, assume that you would get the same number coming in for that uh, when we start with for that period, that same huge increase. Um, and we're creaking to do exports. I don't think we've got any chance of doing imports successfully um, and in a sustainable system. Gail, finally. Thank you. And, and what I would <clears throat> add as well, I mean, obviously, if, from an NFU perspective, we would love to be the supplier of choice for, for all British consumers here. But there is obviously things that we do need to import from the EU because we don't produce them here or not in the quantities. We recognise that we import about 30% of the food that we consume in the UK from the EU. So this has to be done. Um, with one eye, recognising that we are heavily reliant on, on our food supply from from the EU. However, from a farmer's perspective, it is frustrating that our exporters are facing the full extent of the EU um, uh, controls at the border, and yet uh, imports from the EU can um, more or less flow in largely um, you know, un unhindered. Um, from a biosecurity perspective, um, by and large, we you know, do recognise that the EU has similar approaches and, and, and rules that, that we have. James, I'm sure, will talk about the surveillance um, databases that we no longer have access uh, to. But our concern is actually more about rest of world product entering the EU, transiting through the EU to come to our shores. And there was early on um, some concern about just how robust, if you imagine, and I don't want to name any names, if you imagine product coming from a country outside of the EU, flying into an EU port and then being trucked uh, on a lorry into, uh, into Dover. You know, are there robust checks in place at Dover to make sure that that product is not bringing any kind of threat of, of disease or uh, food um, uh, risk to, to, to humans? Um, and we were concerned about that. And the government has tightened some of the, the guidelines which does require goods that are transiting the EU to, to be checked uh, through a border control post. 
but that does rely on, on the importer um, going to those border control posts and, and having their goods uh, checked. So um, there is definitely some concern that our external borders are not as robust as they need to be at, at the moment. Thank you very much, everyone. Mr Chair. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, Dr Jeff Mackey, please, the eighth question. Thank you very much, Mr Chair. Um, it's been well documented that one of our businesses that works in biopesticides didn't manage to get through phytosanitary checks for nearly six months. Um, I'd like to try and dig into some of the detail a little bit regarding process, because the EU has an extensive process for approving countries and establishments that export into the block. I just wonder, would our witnesses like to comment on what extent they think the UK government is planning to replicate these extensive processes? Gary, could we start with you, please? And thanks very much for joining us while you're on holiday, by the way. It's always appreciated. <laughs> You're, you're welcome, Jeff uh, and colleagues. Um, it's a really, really good question. Um, I, I have to say I don't have any specific detailed insight, but I, I do have uh, some reflections to offer that are based on what is in the public domain thus far. Um, First of all, it's all, it's obviously within our gift, within the government's gift, to 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 make decisions around the extent to which uh, they will they they will they will make provisions for this. But it does kind of go back to what I've been saying from the start. Um, you know, food standards and robust food standards are about public protection. Um, the government has repeatedly stated that it will not compromise on our food standards and on health protection but it has have it has to be said thus far singularly and spectacularly failed to legislate for that um and and, and that goes back to uh, the need for proper robust veterinary agreements and standards that i i would argue let's let's aim for surpassing uh the the, the standards within the eu Let's have the best food and environmental standards in the world, um, because that will ultimately add value to our food products. And just to come back to something that Gail said, um, and I have, you know, I think this is a, a different a different point, but it's an important one. Um, we are reliant currently on the rest of the world for our food supply. Um, and rather frustratingly from me, for me personally, from an environmental sustainability perspective, um, we seem to send a lot of our very high quality products all around the world and then bring products in from other parts of the world to replace them. Um, so there is data to indicate that. There is, there's data that suggests that we actually export, for example, poultry uh, and chicken products, uh, chicken, fresh chicken in particular, and then bring in fresh chicken to replace it from somewhere else. And that just doesn't make any sense. So in the longer, to me anyway, in the longer term, we need a proper, robust food strategy for these islands. Um, again, that's another piece of work, but it is important to make that point, I think. So the, 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 to answer your question, the extent to which we, we make provision for this, it's within our gift to do it. And I would argue that that would actually uh, make us world leaders and, and, and increase the value of our food products in a global marketplace. Gary, thanks very much. Unfortunately, the time I've got doesn't permit me to explore the question of food sustainability because frankly, um, there's a number of us would love to get stuck into that for some hours. Uh, however, let me just move on and James, could I just pick up this question of competence when we talk about processes and checks and approvals? When we talk about your profession, there's another conversation there. Would you like to comment on that? I think perhaps the bit I would like to add to what Gary said is that um, you know, we recognise that there is both a challenge here in terms of the commitment which was made in the government manifesto to not allowing um, our farm 
health and welfare standards to be diminished by uh, importing food that was produced to, to lower standards elsewhere. And at the moment we don't see the opportunity for that um, commitment to be met in the um, uh, you know, in, in the SPS chapters of proposed sort of trade agreements. But what we would see is an opportunity for us to just be a little bit more um, focused on GB's needs as well here as we think about these processes and mm -hmm. uh, 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 what we're going to approve and what we're not. And if I can perhaps pick an example of that, um, we could be very industry specific and say, look, the EU doesn't have a significant outdoor pig population the UK does. So starting to think about health and welfare chapters which um, are particular to that pig industry and protect them from uh, you know from any kind of uh, imported disease or, or challenge it would be something that we would see a great uh, say opportunity for vets to engage and to uh, help to deliver that in the future. Thanks, James. Um, g given the time I have, Gail, would the NFU like to have the last word on this one since we've moved in the direction of talking about food again as well? I think it's a, it's a chapter which would take a long time. I'm very happy to come back to another session and, and, and talk um, uh, at length about it. Um, we obviously welcome the Trade and Agriculture Commission, the statutory tax they call for experts has been established on, on Monday. Um, like the other uh, experts, we are waiting to see, for example, the Australian FTA, if it's going to be agreed in principle next week. Let's see, let's see whether the government is actually translating its manifesto commitment into meaningful, um, genuine safeguards for uh, our standards and, and our values, because it's very great. And I agree with, with Gary, it would be a very laudable ambition to have but if we are undercut by imports that have been produced to a much cheaper standard, then that does nothing to keep British farmers in, in business and, and able to deliver those environmental goods that, that we know that, that British citizens uh, want here in the UK. So it's a very, very complex uh, subject. And I think in the next week or so, we will see some of the, the proof will be in the pudding, let's say. Thanks very much, Gail. It would be remiss of me not to use the word educating the consumer to finish this particular conversation, but I'll hand back happily to the chair. Thank you very much. Chairman. Thank you, Jeff. Sorry, um, Chair. Chair, could I just chip in as a last, as a last yes, sentence on that? You may. Um, I think it, it's the, the checks are absolutely essential. Um, we have to recreate that system that the EU had as a whole. Um, and standards, as Gary said, standards are essential and that approval process is the first step in ensuring our standards from imported product. Gary mentioned chicken. It's a really good example because we tend to export dark meat because we don't eat it and import breast meat because that's what we like. So, the, but we are in danger of being undercut by lower standards if we are not active in that process of approving third countries, we need to get good at this and get good at it quickly. Thank you very much. That's an issue that is going to be very much to the fore, as has already been said, and I suspect even the next few days. Question nine, Caroline Lucas, please. Thank you very much, Chair. And in fact, actually, my, my question has been sort of touched on by all of you. Um, so I guess I'm just inviting you to, to give any more detail um, in terms of the risks of what we're talking about here, because the question was really about what are the risks to the UK of the current situation in which there are few checks on food arriving from the EU. And you've spoken about the, the pressure on lower standards. You've, you've talked about public safety. You've talked, Gary, in particular, about rising food crime. I wonder if you could just give a little bit more flesh on the bones of, of, of some of those concerns and maybe give a few examples. I was going to start with, with, with Gail and then come to Gary. I'm very happy to defer to the other uh, experts. Um, Carlin, if that's OK. OK, sure. Let's go to Gary then. Um. Th thanks, Caroline, for the question. It's, it's another, yet another really important area in, in my view. Um, I actually, just first of all on data, um, I actually had attempted in advance of this session to get some data on this pulled together for colleagues on the committee. Um, my sources, I haven't managed to get that yet, but they have promised they will get it to me. And mm -hmm. when it comes to me, I will make it available to all of you. Mm -hmm. um, 
but suffice to say, and, and it's quite interesting, um, as some of you may, well, many of you may be aware, uh, there is a national food crime agency uh, under the jurisdiction of the FSA. Um, the capacity within that has been increased once we made the decision to uh, leave the European Union. You can deduct from that what you will, but I know that, um, and this goes way back to my own experience practicing on the ground, I mean, and even just within, within the island of Ireland, but it's a good example of, of why controls and borders are so important. Um, unfortunately, the reality is that food crime is a very lucrative criminal activity. Um, you know, we all remember the horse meat scandal, which of course, thankfully did not have any public health implications. And I'm not suggesting that food crime uh, in its totality uh, or, or that all examples of food crime necessarily have public direct public health implications. Quite often they don't. And it's about substitution of products that are not what they say they are or are of lesser quality than they should be. Um, but it is a very, very lucrative criminal uh, activity. Um, and therefore, once there are gaps, um, um, and, and I think that the movement, I know there's a question on this later on, the movement of goods from Northern Ireland in the GB is, is a particular area um, which, you know, would leave an open door, in my view, for criminals to potentially get products into GB. Um, once you leave those get doors open, uh, people will take advantage of them, unfortunately. Um, so that 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 I think is, is, you know, we need to be we need to be clear that that is a reality that we're living with here, um, and there are potentially risks to, you know, public health that could arise as a result of that, and um, particularly whenever you consider um, the whole matter of, for example, allergens within the, uh, the the food landscape. So it's a really important thing to bear in mind um, in, the, in the context of this whole discussion. Thank you so much. And I will get you that data whenever, whenever it's available. That data sounds like it'd be really, really important. Thank you so much. I don't know if James or, or Richard wanted to add anything at this point. James, yeah. Thank you, Caroline. If I may, and I think unsurprisingly, I would come at this from you know an animal health um, angle potentially a little bit more. So, you know, we've already talked about the fact that the delays in import checks, you know, have um, you know, been welcomed in terms of being able to set up um, the uh, infrastructure required to take them, undertake them, and that the chief veterinary officer you know continues to maintain those relationships to protect the country, but. You know, we recognise there's going to be a period where, for example, live animal checks are not taking place at the ports at border control points. And yeah, that's not ideal. If we think about the most recent diseases that have come into the country, we're talking about things like blue tongue and Schmallenberg disease, which are diseases which are spread by um, insect vectors, by midges. So you know, if you're having to transport those animals away into the country before they're being checked for that, then you know, it's not hard to see how that um, could uh, make those borders a little bit more leaky um, and I think therefore you know that's what we're really trying to seek is assurances that we're not um, risking those diseases coming into the country uh, you know, by by these delays because ultimately you know the line we keep going back with is that these diseases do not respect political borders um, and as vets that's I suppose where we want to want to sit we recognise that the Trade Specialised Committee on Sanitary Fighter Sanitary measure, Measures, where UK and EU can meet and discuss the operation of these arrangements, uh, is in place. And so we implore the UK government to continue to engage both with industry and with the veterinary profession to understand our priorities that they can take to those specialised committees. Thank you very much. That's, that's very worrying. Richard, I don't know if you wanted to add anything. Just a, very quickly, I think this this is, it calls more than anything for a real risk-based approach. We know what the risks are, and they've been highlighted here, whether it's crime or it's animal health. We know what they are, and they need to be focused on. And why it's so important to go back to the whole veterinary agreement as to what 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 we could do somewhere else in a different location, and what we must do at the border. 
So risk-based approach is essential here, to my mind. Lovely. Thank you all very much. And, and back to you, Chair. Thanks, Caroline. James, you touched on something that Aidan Connolly wanted to raise. Um, he's asked me to raise it in his absence. Um, do we have any idea, you referred to the checks being carried out now, how many checks are being carried out on movements? I'm talking about animal movements between Great Britain and Northern Ireland. What increase in those checks, if any, is going to be imposed at the end of the grace period? And are those numbers significantly greater than the checks currently imposed by the EU? Do you know? Uh, thank you, Chair. Very happy to take that. And I think you know, I would point you to the evidence given by Northern Ireland Chief Veterinary Officer Robert Huey to the ERA Committee, where he uh, highlighted that he felt that in order to carry out the number of checks he was doing at the moment, he needed another 12 vets, and that that has uh, not, he's not been able to recruit those people at the moment. Um, the, um, at that time, Dara Minister Edwin Poots suggested that 400 staff, of whom 200 would be vets, would be needed after the grace period, but um, we've yet to see the sort of evidence behind that. But, you know, um, our best guess, uh, and government's best guess, I think, is that the increase in export health certificates from GB to Northern Ireland at the end of the Stamney arrangements, maybe somewhere between 70 and 150,000 certificates per year, or roughly kind of 70 full time equivalent vets to just complete those certificates. So it's important, I think, always when we talk about full time equivalents to recognise that that's not just people you know, working part time or whatever, it's the fact that some of this work will happen um, you know, out of hours, at weekends, whatever, and therefore the overall number of people that we need. Um, to carry out that work will be much greater than that um, and DEFRA surveyed OBs themselves and identified that the average OB thought they might spend 15% of their time working on, um, on on export work so that 70 full-time equivalents could be um, you know somewhere up to 700 actual vets so we recognize you know, that there is potentially a great demand um, and but it is all estimates at the moment I'm afraid chair how does that compare with the checks imposed by the EU? Um, again, I would point to Robert's evidence where he highlighted that he anticipated that at the end of the Stanley period that Northern Ireland would be likely to be um, undertaking the majority of checks within the European Union. Thank you very much indeed. Question 11, Hilary Bennett, please. Uh, thank you very much <coughs> indeed, Chair. Gary, just a quick question to you to start with. Uh, you've said, and we know that food crime is rife, but presumably that's a risk whether we are or are not aligned with the EU's food and agri-food rules. Is that right? Uh, yes, it, it is, of course. Right. But, okay. but, but the point I was making is that um, the potential for criminals to look to exploit those opportunities, if you can call them opportunities, ultimately depends, uh, I mean, let me put it a different way. They will look at the uh, landscape um, to determine how easy or how difficult it will be to get products that are either adulterated or misdescribed um, or are otherwise interfered with through controls. So, so you know, it's about it's about how easy or difficult it actually is to get away with it. Right. Okay. That's very helpful. Thank you. Um, secondly, and I, I don't know whether James or Gail would like to respond to this. We obviously were aligned with the EU up to the thirty first of December, uh, and there there weren't uh, all of these additional checks. We remain aligned because we haven't diverged. So. The question I want to ask is, from a from a risk point of view, what is the risk at the moment, given that we're following the same rules that we were before, that any food products, agri-food products going from GB to Northern Ireland could effectively undermine the integrity of the single market? And if I can just take the classic example, because there's never really been a satisfactory answer a Sainsbury lorry load of food going to one of its supermarkets. Um, we know that we're, if we get to the point where export health certificates are required, that's a lot of items and a lot of cost. 
what is the actual risk of any of those products um, having turned up on the shelves, being bought by consumers, taken home and consumed, of undermining the integrity of the single market in the Republic? Could anyone like to offer a view? Yes, Gail. I suppose flippantly, I would say it's a question for the EU chief vet to to answer rather than than us, because uh, you're right, the risk hasn't presented itself, and I would say maybe yet. I guess speaking on behalf of what I hear from our European colleagues, and, and I hear it from the French farmers, for example, they are very concerned about this. Um, the idea that we do a deal with the US or with Australia, and there is in free circulation on the GB market product that doesn't adhere to EU standards. So, you know. That, that, is, that indeed is a very fair point. I, I, my question was about now, today, and clearly, if we choose to diverge by accepting those products in any future US UK trade deal, then that would change the situation. But it is about uh, today, what is the actual risk? And since there has been a grace period, what is the argument about further against further extending a grace period for now, while we continue to observe all of the same rules and standards that we did before uh, the 31st of December? That, that I suppose is the question. And we haven't got an EU, um, uh, anyone who could speak on behalf of the EU in, in a veterinary uh, form, but thank you for attempting to do so. Gary, I saw you waving your hand. Yeah, I, I think to try and tackle your question, I, I think, you know, Obviously, if we are still aligned, and incidentally, um, and I don't have the, again, I would need to get the information on this, but colleagues have suggested that there actually has already been some divergence um, where there's been some changes to European standards and the, the, the directive from the UK government is we adhere to the standards as they were on the 31st, on the 31st of December. So there is potentially some divergence, but, but, but leaving that aside, um, to answer your question, if we're aligned with the EU, then the risk is minimal. Right. Um, okay. And 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 that 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 of course comes back to the point that we've referred to several times this morning uh, in the importance moving forward of of proper negotiated veterinary agreements, um, and because that is that is for me the single biggest thing that we could do to resolve some of the problems that are being experienced, both in terms of the additional costs and strains on businesses, as well as the increased capacity uh, demands on, on, on those on the certifying side. Okay. I can see James has his hand up, so I'll, I'll stop there. Well, I, I, James, I'll bring you in, but can I just pose a related question arising from what Gary's just said? To what extent could the number of checks we're talking about the number of checks a lot this morning, uh, ultimately carried out, be reduced by either an equivalence agreement, I, we're, gonna, we're gonna show that we maintain the same standards, or a joint veterinary zone, or I suppose both. How much of the problem would go away? We've heard the figure 80% talked about. Is that? Do you think that's a fair number from your point of view, James? Uh, I'm afraid I've not got a specific number to hand, but you're absolutely right, of course, that an alignment agreement would see us, you know, absolutely mirror our regulations indefinitely. And it's important to recognise, of course, that you know, we are no longer directly aligned, as, as Gary alluded to, um, you know, we aligned from the 31st of December, change in EU animal health laws on the 21st of April, which is what brought in uh, the requirement for the reportable diseases and so on from, um, from United Kingdom. Uh, from GB. I think it's perhaps also important to mention while I'm confusing GB and, uh, and UK there, of course, you know, but for these purposes, Northern Ireland is the single market, isn't it? So, so we've got to uh, bear that in mind when we think about how we're going to continue to um, get goods right round the United Kingdom. But the sort of flip side, I think, of what you're saying is if we do have this full regulatory alignment, then it reduces the scope for the bespoke 
um, regulatory approaches within the within GB. And I'm thinking back there again to the comments I made earlier about um, outdoor pig industry, for example, but also the forthcoming um, European Medicines Legislation Review that we're expecting towards the end of this year. It may be, I don't, I don't wish to sort of prejudge any, anything that comes out of that, but it may be that there are um, changes to medicines legislation within the EU, which GB um, feels differently on the evidence of. So in alignment, yes, it would reduce our need for checks, but would also reduce our ability to um, take our own regulatory approach. Thank you. That That is really helpful. Back to you, Chair. Thank you very much indeed. Paul Blomfield, question 12, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. And I'd really like to take up from um, Hillary's uh, points there and perhaps you know, James's um, closing comment, because obviously this whole debate is uh, is, is, is about the um, options that we have in relation to divergence um, or alignment of whatever sort, um, whether that's a Swiss style or a New Zealand style. Um, now, I, I sense all of the uh, all of the arguments we've heard this morning are that some form of alignment will solve the problems that we have going forward. Clearly, the UK government is resistant to that, precisely because of the points James has just been making in terms of the opportunities provided um, through divergence. I get no sense within um, the, uh, the farming and food sector that divergence would be welcome. Um, but I wonder if you could um, say a little bit uh, about the impact of divergence um, on uh, the regulations governing food movement from uh, from GB and uh, what that what that terrain begins to look like and perhaps I could start with Richard yes I, I think divergence and it may depend on, on the extent and the type but divergence broadly speaking would be disastrous for the for the trade between the UK and EU, it would in effect mean that the systems that we have in place now, those burdensome checks at the border, would be here to stay. There will be no way around having those. Remember, when we were part of the EU, we, we as members had to demonstrate, our food producers had to demonstrate that they were following the regulations. The idea now that we're outside of the EU and we've got this hard, hard border, that's where the checks are. With a veterinary agreement, we can maybe roll some of that back to say, how can we demonstrate as part of our regular everyday processes that we're in alignment and therefore you don't need the checks? As soon as you diverge, that's when you that's when the EU, and I would say quite rightly, and if the roles were reversed, we would say the same thing. No. You, you have different standards, therefore we do not want your products coming into our area without it being checked that it meets our standards. So really that's the, that's the upshot of divergence in the, in, the, in, the, in, the first, in the practical sense. Those hard borders will be there to stay. Thanks very much. Gail, I wonder if I could um, ask you what the farming community uh, yeah. feels about the issue. Yeah, so I think um, the, the important starting point is the, kind of the, the premise of what sort of relationship we're, we're talking about with, with the EU. Um, I don't necessarily agree that a veterinary agreement would require us to have alignment of, of regulations de facto or de jure. I think it's a more a question of focusing on, on the outcomes or the outcomes equivalents in terms of, of regulatory terms. If you look at New Zealand and the UK, you know, they don't follow word by word exactly the same regulations to be able to unlock the benefits of the veterinary agreement. Um, if you look at the Swiss model, again, um, Switzerland is not, is not de jure that they have to follow the letter of the EU law, they actually look at them on a sort of case by case basis and by and large they do. So on a de facto basis, yes, they do follow the EU rules, but it's not de jure. Um, and I think at the heart of a lot of farmers' concerns is that we have taken back sovereign control of, of our rules. Um, 
what we would want is to be able to look at the rules on a, on a case by case basis to weigh up what it actually means, the cost, the benefit. And by far, the vast majority in terms of the, the, the benefits would be outweighed by the cost of the friction in terms of doing business with our uh, largest export market. So, but the ability to be able to do that assessment as and when large significant pieces of legislation like the, the veterinary medicines uh, directive that, that James talks about is what farmers want. They don't want to be rule takers. They don't want to be uh, told that they have to follow the EU rules with no real ability to influence that. And I think that's the same in, in Northern Ireland uh, as well, the current situation. But what they want to be able to do is say, well, where we have the same values, where we achieve the same outcomes, we should be able to benefit from that and reduce the friction at the border. So I think from a long answer to go back to the very start, which is you know, the, the premise of our relationship, um, you know, I, I, the UK government has said alignment, dynamic alignment is a red line for them. But I think there are ways and means that you can achieve the same outcomes without having to fulfill dynamic alignment, which is what the EU is currently uh, demanding. So there's this standoff in the negotiations, and I think there is room for both sides to show willingness to, to move towards each other to find some solutions. Thanks very much. I mean, you make a very important point there, Gail, because there is a perception um, that alignment means a unmoving straitjacket with no no room at all. So, it, if you if if you're saying that even the Swiss model um, provides some opportunities for uh, the sort of flexibility the sector might need, that's uh, that's that's an important point. I wonder, um, Gary or James, whether you have any reflections on the issue. Uh, Thanks, Paul. I'm I'm not sure that I have a huge amount more to add to what uh, Gail and Richard have already said. Um, I think Gail is making an important point um, about ways and means to achieve the same thing. Um, and I think that is where we really need to focus our efforts because, you know, um, again, I, I know I've said this repeatedly, but that, that is for me the single most effective solution to all of this. Um, James, do you have anything to add? I started my question by quoting your comments. No, thank you. And, and I guess what I'd almost like to do is put the flip of the comment that I just made to, to Hilary Ben, which would be to reflect that, that, you know, in a nutshell, greater divergence means greater risk, means greater checks. So the closer that we remain you know, to alignment, the fewer those checks need to be. And again, I would point back to the GB Northern Ireland um, trade, where back in December, Robert Huey said to the Northern Ireland Affairs Committee that he'd found a way within the existing EU regs to reduce the level of those physical checks potentially down to zero for supermarket consignments. And he'd done that in conjunction with the UK CVO, but he wouldn't be able to do that if GB diverged from um, you know, from EU regulation. But the other side to it, I guess, is that as we see potentially greater divergence, the risks um, to our producers here of perhaps having dual certification or you know, dual herds where one is working to an EU standard, one's working to a GB standard in order to be able to satisfy both of those markets. And I think that's something that we would have uh, you know, some real concerns about. Many thanks. Um, back to you, Chair. Thank you very much indeed, Paul. Stephen Farry, please, question 13. Stephen, do we have it? Hi, Chair, it's Alison. I think I'm allocated uh, question 13, so I can jump oh. in. I beg your pardon. I've got yeah. Stephen Farry on my list, but that's fine. Go yeah. ahead. Oh, yeah, I think I'll ask you your 14s um, on the trade barriers issue. They're probably the same the same right. issue, I think, ultimately. Um, thank you, Chair. I just wanted to um, sort of follow on fairly deeply from Paul's questions in relation to um, the forthcoming Australia free trade agreement, uh, so called, and the potential for on a much longer uh, spectrum, the uh, US uh, free trade agreement. And to maybe just ask the question, to what extent um, does either of those scenarios close off um, or limit our options in terms of the, the nature of any veterinary agreement we can have with the European Union? Presumably, it majorly constrains the Swiss model, but may uh, still allow, to a large extent, the New Zealand uh, approach. 
and noting in this regard that we're perhaps talking very quickly about an Australia type approach, uh, but the US uh, administration's making clear that there's no real immediate prospect on the, on that and that their uh, immediate preference is that the European that the UK would align with the, the European Union on veterinary standards, not least for the Northern Ireland uh, situation. So there's a fair degree of political aspect to this as well. So essentially, I mean, to what extent are those free trade agreements mutually exclusive to our options on veterinary agreements? And maybe just ask Richard, Gail and Gary in that order. Um, I think the, the the basis of the free trade agreements and the, and where we as a as a sector come from is that we what we're asking for is is a level playing field, happy to compete with other countries on a level playing field of standards, um, and to be able to ensure that. Um, I think a veterinary agreement can be as 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 wide or as narrow as you as you want it to be. It can it can talk it can focus on specific issues in our own in our own um, area. It might be avian influenza or other animal health diseases, or it could be broader into into as we've been talking about the food and food and farming. I don't think the free trade agreements would necessarily uh, limit the scope of veterinary agreements. That's a very sweeping statement. Um, but what I, I think the big threat from free trade agreements is back to standards. Um, and what we don't want to do is create essentially a two tier food system within the UK, which then that could have further implications for, for, for veterinary agreements um uh, as has been mentioned the eu may not want to run the risk of having australian beef come to them through the uk mm -hmm. so uh, yeah yeah that's, that's presumably where this does become a, a pressure point it does, you, become, it, does become, it does and, and chlorinated chicken keeps getting mentioned again and again our, our expertise um but again we would like to see the level playing field in the first instance, not having to repair it with veterinary agreements or other machinations after the fact. Protect the standards first, then deal with the, the further agreements and negotiations. Thanks, Richard. And, and Gail and then Gary? Yeah, thank you. So I, I agree with Richard. It's, it's it's unlikely to be the text of the free trade agreement itself. And um, obviously, we'll be looking very closely at the SPS chapters to see what what they say. But I would very much doubt that the UK, after having hard fought, won our independence to regulate um, post Brexit, that it would then give it up very quickly to Australia. So I doubt it will be the uh, the international treaty itself that the thing we'll need to watch for. It will, however, be if, for example, tariffs are removed on, on beef or on chicken from the US, and it becomes a much more commercially attractive proposition to send that product to the UK, it's at that point our secondary legislation will come under pressure. You will get applications to the Food Standards Agency to uh, authorise new decontaminant uh, material for carcasses. You will probably get an application to allow certain growth promoters in, in the use of, of beef. And, and that's why we are really concerned at the NFU that the, the, the level of scrutiny that we have in Parliament around the consequences of free trade agreements is, has been you know, a real point of concern for us. And hopefully these are the sorts of things that the, the Trade and Agriculture Commission will, will flag when they, when they see these uh, international treaties. Um, I take the example of, I, I can't off the top of my mind remember if it was hormone beef or chlorinated chickens, it was one or the other of them, to change that rule in UK law, secondary legislation, it just requires a, a, a negative SI procedure and, and the, the likelihood of there being a debate in, in Parliament and it being uh, you know, turned over if the UK decided that that product was safe is, is probably minimal. But we, we sort of jump ahead of ourselves many, many moves down, down the line. So it's not necessarily the, the trade deal itself, um, it's what could follow in, in the secondary legislation. Under the trade deal and what I suspect the EU would be looking at very robustly is the rules of origin. You then start to see the play between SPS and customs uh, legislation coming in. And if they 
think that Australian product is in free circulation on our, our market, it's produced to cheaper uh, environmental standards, animal welfare standards, it can undercut their producers, then they will be really looking to enforce the rules of origin to make sure that that Australian beef does not end up on their European uh, uh, market. Okay. Thanks. And Gary? Uh, thanks, Stephen. I think really, again, just to emphasise the points that both Richard and Gail have made, um, Richard's absolutely right. It's about standards um, at the heart of this, um, you know, and and you have to ask yourself the question, why are neither of these uh, uh, trade agreements within the scope currently? Or or rather, why are they not, were they not currently within the scope of the previous EU arrangements whenever we were part of the EU? I mean, ask yourself that question. And without actually going through the actual standards um, themselves as per pertaining to the different countries, I suspect the reason is because they wouldn't have met the European standards. Now, to give you a more practical organic example of this uh, and illustrate what Gail's talking about and why this will, in my view, um, make agreements moving forward more difficult with the EU. Um, Gil has already talked about these kind of products undercutting our own um, mm -hmm. because the standard, they're produced to cheaper standards and lesser animal welfare uh, arrangements and so on and so forth. Now, a lot of these products are likely to be brought in and end up in what are called composite products. Um, in other words, what I mean is meat products or meat preparations, whether it doesn't matter what kind of meat it is. Um, and what I mean by that in, in layperson's terms is products that contain meat but are not whole cuts of meat, um, which then may subsequently be attempted to be exported to other parts of the world. And that's why, uh, you know, because of the complications and the, ver the difficulties around tracing all of that, um, that's why I suspect that um, if those agreements go ahead, it is highly likely, in my view, that it will make it more difficult to resolve some of the current difficulties we have with EU exports. Mm -hmm. um, and the EU will, in my view, increase the ante, up the ante, if you like, mm -hmm. on, on what they will require. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a final point to make about that as well, which is, um, much has been taught. I mean, I, it's been, we've referred to the the issue of consumer choice when it mm -hmm. comes to um, these kind of products, and 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 you know, the government will say, well, consumers have the choice to choose uh, whether they consume products from Australia, New Zealand, America, uh, or in fact any other part of the world, uh, yeah. as opposed to consuming products from yeah. which originate here, but that's actually not as, as, as straightforward as it sounds. The labeling legislation is very convoluted, it's very complex, it's not always necessarily easy, but more importantly, these kind of products will not end up on supermarket shelves, they'll end up in the NHS and in our schools. Okay, okay th thanks to all, all the witnesses. Back to you, Chair. Thank you very much indeed. Alice, I apologize, I think the questions may have been renumbered since you've got them. You do have the final question, and it may prove to be the most important one of the morning. So the floor's yours. Thank you. Um, so, well, thank you, first of all, to all the witnesses. Um, everything you've talked through today has been incredibly helpful to understand the, the challenges um, that your areas and industries are facing. Um, you have, I think all of you have touched on some of the things that could help um, ease those or address those challenges. What would be really good to close with is um, just to go through uh, your really your top recommendations so what are the one or two things that really would make the biggest impact um, to overcome the barriers that you've described and um, so it would be great to hear from each of you um, if we can start with Gail and then we'll go to Richard, James and Gary. Thank you. Thank you Alison. Um, I think my three top recommendations I would have number one uh, UK government please continue to engage constructively with the EU on securing a way that we can reduce as much as possible the friction uh, that is in place between uh, our trading uh, nations uh, at the moment. I don't necessarily want to get hung up on whether that's a New Zealand style veterinary agreement, a Swiss style um, model. We are in a bespoke situation. We are you know, the closest 
major uh, market for the EU. It's on both sides' interest to try and get a uh, you know, very um, bespoke, robust agreement that, that, that seeks to, to minimise as much friction uh, as possible. My second would be around adequate resourcing um, by the government. Um, yes, there have been efforts to uh, help uh, exporters, but more can be done, whether that is you know, listening to experts like James and, and Richard and, and Gary to ensure that in their professions you have the right qualified staff. You know, if you need to look at uh, the immigration rules or if you need to look at um, routes to employment, please you know, find ways to ensure that there is adequate resources to meet, meet the needs of the export industry. And finally, just clear communications um, for a micro business to be able to navigate the complexity of this, um, all the while hopefully it will get better. It is incredibly uh, complex, uh, more one-stop shops, one more dedicated resources to help those micro businesses and, and small and medium-sized uh, enterprises to be able to, to get back into the export business. So that'll be my three. That's great. Thank you. Very clear. Um, Richard? No, thank you. I, I wouldn't go too much further than that and the recommendations in the SPS report. I think it's really important to recognise that as, as, as important as the discussion today has been, we're trying to fix the effects of something. If we were really, if we're really serious, should go and try and fix the cause of some of these. And that comes back, I think, to standards. We have to be clear about what we want our standards to be. I mean, we, we all as professionals have an opinion on that. We, but as a nation, we have to be clear about what our standards are and accept the consequences of that. But the, the sort of jumping around and shall we do a deal here, shall we do a deal, is not gonna help anyone. I think the standards will then drive everything else that we have to do and everything else that we can do in the future. Okay, thank you. Uh, James? Thank you. And um, I've got sort of three fronts that we would extol government to make their concerted efforts across. Um, and in building into those, if I may just refer back to, to Stephen's question a moment ago and, and highlight that whenever we, whatever I talk about here, it's really important, I think, that we engage the certifiers and the industry as a sort of matter of paramount importance. And the reason I say that refers back to Stephen's question is recognising that at the moment, FSA, uh, Food Standards Association and Food Standards Scotland are being held up as those who can ensure that any food coming in under any trade agreement um, meets the standards that we would expect within the United Kingdom. And of course, that's absolutely true for food safety that it would not be their primary remit to be considering animal health and welfare. So in order to get us to that position, we would say our three areas would be um, that the UK simplifies whatever is in its gift to simplify, whether that's digitalisation or working with business to provide different ways of, of getting the information to the certifying vet quickly. Secondly, having a close look at what can be achieved within the trade cooperation agreement and under the Northern Ireland protocol and that might be um, about using innovation to improve assurance or automating parts of the process but ultimately recognizing that as we said earlier northern ireland isn't the back door into the eu single market it is in the single market gb is the back door so we've got to provide assurance to the eu to enable easy transport of goods to northern ireland and finally the comment that um, understand what industry needs to build a model works for it and it won't be the New Zealand model or the Switzerland model it will be a bespoke model that we will need to build that works for GB. Thank you sounds like there's quite a lot of alignment on the the recommendations so far and um, so just finally to Gary please. Thanks Alison uh, yeah I, 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 I have only very a few additional comments to make uh, um, to what Richard and, and, and Gail and James have just said. I totally agree with Richard. I think the standards are absolutely the, 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 the top of the list here. Totally agree with what he said. The only thing I would add to that is, don't forget that it's not just about food standards, it's about environmental standards as well, because the two are fundamentally linked. Um, and, and the EU would take that view as well. I know that from past engagement with them on this. Um, 
the, the the point about streamlining we talked about particularly stream at a pragmatic level trying to streamline the administration around this uh, but while still maintaining its integrity um and i think and finally i think that we, you know we we could look at, at maybe some greater flexibility in who carries out what checks uh, in the uk it's important to make the point that that um, the UK doesn't just have veterinarians, it has environmental health professionals, and that is quite unique within the EU. It's important for the, committee to un the Commission to understand that. The rest of the EU don't have EHPs, and that's part of the reason why the requirements in their original form stipulated veterinarians. Um, so, you know, we, 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 we could look, I mean, if you apply a risk assessment model to this, um, there are different levels of risk associated with different types of processes, products, uh, foodstuffs, um, and so on and so forth. So there's there's maybe scope for some greater flexibility, which would help in some way around our, uh, with our capacity issues. That's great. Thank you. It's that kind of um, detail that we really need to draw out in these sessions. So thank you for raising that. OK, um, thanks all for, for your answers. Uh, back to the chair. Thank you very much indeed. If I can editorialise momentarily, when we left the European Union, we were told that it would be the opportunity to ensure that we did not import goods, particularly foodstuffs, produced under conditions that we would not permit in the United Kingdom. That comes back to standards, and that is absolutely vital, and that is one of the clear messages that has come through this morning. Gail Souter, James Russell, Gary McFarlane, Richard Griffiths, thank you all very much indeed for participating and for giving us your time this morning. The Commission is indebted to you and I hope that your views will be, in fact I know that your views will be fairly reflected in the report that we ultimately produce. Meeting closed. Thank, thank you everyone. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you everyone.